what we're doing today is basically sanding. So we're using a 40, 80, 180, 400, 600, and 1200 sandpapers. And all of those are actually sandpapers, they're not lapping. Lapping is something that's even beyond polishing because um, that's the point where it's extremely flat. The man we saw in the intro was Der Bauer, and as he correctly points out, wet sanding is not lapping. In the world of machining, the domain I inhabit, lapping is a process achieved with a lapping plate and an abrasive suspended in a thin film of oil. In industrial settings, it's typically performed by dedicated lapping machines, but it can also be done by hand entirely without any sort of precision instruments. Hand lapping is actually very easy to get into. As a precision machining process, it has by far the lowest barrier to entry of any. However, the only things I'm able to find when searching online for CPU lapping is people using sandpaper. Even when Steve Burke of Gamers Nexus visited a record setting overclocker Kingpin and was shown the machine he uses in his office at EVGA, it was a sanding machine. So this is, I guess, a TNP 2020 FR, yep. the sanding machine. This had me thinking, how hard can it be to do this properly and what are the potential benefits? The only measurements I've been able to find so far of a sanded CPU were from the German website OC Inside. They were able to produce a surface that was flat to an accuracy of 30 microns, but even these people didn't use the tools, materials, or measuring equipment to produce something that was flat to the degree I'm going to be showing you in this video. So, just what the hell is lapping? What you are looking at are not waffle irons, they're lapping plates. Surfaces of near-perfect flatness I made myself after being inspired by Tom Lipton of Ox Toolco. I cut a chunk of scrap steel into three equally thick plates, and after facing them on a lathe, started lapping them together. A on B, B on C, C on A, over and over again. This method, called the three-plate method, was initially invented by English engineer Joseph Whitworth, and allows you to create flat surfaces to incredible degrees of accuracy without any reference by rubbing three plates together in succession, you will remove the high spots they have in common. The end result can only be a flat plane. This is a really elegant way of creating precision from nothing and can be used to also create angle plates and master squares. Any number of tools can then be created using them as a reference. Nearly every piece of technology you enjoy in your life today can trace its accuracy to a surface plate created using the three-plate method. Wet sanding can't do this. Even if using a perfectly flat surface as a base for your sandpaper, you will always be prevented from achieving a truly flat result by the cushion of previously abraded material your workpiece is being pushed around on. That's what these grooves are for. They are channels that collect the material being removed and also help keep the abrasive film uniform. Hand lapping is only a finishing process, however. While, sure, I could take my 3950X and lap it from start to finish, it'd take me forever. Keep in mind, a CPU IHS is very far from flat. Die pressing sheet metal is not a process that results in precision parts. So. What is my roughing operation going to be then? I don't have access to a surface grinder, so this hand-cranked mill will have to do. I'm just playing this by ear, and I don't even have inserts on hand for soft metals. But the result I'm getting here is much flatter than what I began with, and dramatically reduces the time spent with sandpaper to get me to the point where I'm able to begin the lapping process proper. To protect the pins of my CPU from getting bent or contaminated by any abrasive, 
I also created this fixture from a piece of scrap stainless, but floral foam works great too. I'll let you in on a little secret here. You don't need any of this to lap your CPU or cooler. Just lap them together. You won't get a flat result this way. One surface is going to end up convex and the other concave. There's also going to be some roll-off towards the edges, but they will match. A counterintuitive principle of lapping is, however, that the lapping plate must be softer than the workpiece. Otherwise, what will happen is the workpiece will become charged with the abrasive and wear down the plate. So while cast iron is ideal for stainless and hardened steels, it's no good for lapping softer metals. It is for this reason that copper is a common material used to make lapping plates, since its softness all but guarantees it will be able to take a charge and produce the desired results. The only downside being that it may have to be reconditioned more often. But lapping soft metals is a real challenge copper in particular. Not only is creating the plates a problem all on its own since relatively soft, non-embedding abrasives must be used. If for example a diamond compound is used, the risk is significant that a sharp piece of diamond will embed into one surface and shave off a chip from the other, creating a deep gouge and fouling the work. After experimenting with different methods and techniques over the course of several weeks, what I found could reliably produce a submicron finish was using a layer of aluminum foil on top one of my lapping plates for final finishing. The foil has an extraordinarily uniform thickness, so introduces no error as long as you spread it evenly, and is so soft it will take a charge using a diamond abrasive. Without me having to worry, it will embed in the copper. The obvious downside is the foil will easily get torn and can only be used for final polishing. It is very sensitive to all manner of minor annoyances, any tiny piece of dirt in between it and the lapping plate, and it will tear. Too much oil, and it will tear. Too little oil, well you get the idea. I started this project to investigate two questions. Here I have the answer to the first. It was much more difficult than anticipated. Once I had found the proper technique, however, I was able to observe an interesting phenomenon. Two surfaces, sufficiently flat and smooth, can be wrung together. They will stick together and can resist great forces pulling on them. Wringing is not dependent on the properties of metals. Ceramics can be wrung in a vacuum, so it's an effect that occurs regardless of material choice or ambient pressure. The world was introduced to ringing in 1896 when Carl Edvard Johansson invented gauge blocks. Reference blocks lapped to astonishingly precise dimensional tolerances. And for over a hundred years, the exact physical properties governing this effect have defied explanation. What is conclusive, however, is that ringing is a result of intermolecular forces and that has me thinking if maybe thermal paste may be obsolete by this point. Thermal paste exists, after all, to fill the voids between a CPU and cooler. But what if there are no voids? Sadly, the answer to this question I'm not able to explore. I started out with a Supreme LTX water block that saw almost a decade of service in my Sandy Bridge system. In face milling and lapping it, I made a terrible mistake by disassembling it first. When reassembled, the central o-ring presses down on the fin stack and deforms the cold plate, voiding all progress I thought I'd made towards making it flat. It also meant I'd lost the only point of comparison I had to a standard system configuration. I've since replaced it with a new water block that I also lapped to a matching accuracy. But even if I were to pull the trigger and run my system without any thermal paste, I'd still be left unsatisfied because I can't know how that would compare to what I started out with. At the end of the day, I'm just a machinist who wanted to see if he could get his CPU to run a little cooler. I don't have the time or the hardware on hand to create massive bar graphs comparing every single performance variable. But I did get in touch with a guy who does. 
Hello, this is Beavster. Stirk.